This is a mimesis of the Gospel of John, chapter 5. Now, one thing I want to uh, make sure we understand as we uh, move forward is some of these chapters, especially the mid-chapters, uh, there, there, there's going to be a lot of propaganda within the chapters, uh, meaning there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, there's going to be miracles, there's going to be um, uh, certain sayings, uh, uh, specific little theologies that don't have a lot of meat on the bone. Um, typically, most of the mimesis found is going to be found usually the beginning of the gospel and more towards the latter part of the gospel. Because that's where most of your stories are from. Uh, as we're now going to get into John chapter 5, there, there are definitely a couple stories within this with the act of mimesis. But just understand that these chapters here, are there's a lot of fill work in here. Um, now, as we go forward, the stories will get more ramped up. Because what mimesis again is, and I know I've, I've explained this in other videos, but mimesis requires a story, a, a core story, whatever the story may be. Because that's what Mimesis is. It's taking an old story and just re-updating that same story and same theme. But changing the name of the character and then intentionally making your new character a better version than the old. So when you get into chapters uh, and a little bit here in John chapter 5, when you get into a little bit of chapters that don't have a lot of stories in it, but it has a lot of just sayings, uh, little theologies, you don't get a lot of that Mimesis act there. So... That's why I'm going to try to fill in some gaps with stories that may not be found in the Gospel of John, but are found in other Gospels. I'll try to implement them as we go as well. Let's go ahead and start with that, knowing that uh, going forward. Let's go ahead and start here at verse 1 of chapter 5. Uh, this is uh, the healing at the pool. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethsaida and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, It is a Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up your pick up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. Let's pause after just a second here uh, through the first 15 verses. A couple things to go over here. So, number one, you know, uh, this, this, of course, is the painting of the picture, the propaganda of anti-Semitism. Uh, those, those wicked Jewish leaders uh, that held to the law, you know, you know it, it forbade this man to pick up his mat and walk. Jesus, being the kind, merciful character, is, is, is saying, you know, in another verse, he says, you know, the uh, uh, man wasn't made for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for the man, uh, or vice versa. So, in other words, you know, it's better to heal on the Sabbath than not. Um, but this is part of that propaganda to paint a picture to categorize the Jewish leaders as these wicked men, uh, unthoughtful men, men that hold to the law. You know, they, you know, even though this is what the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures demands, um, but you know, we forget about all of that. But it's hard. It's painting that picture, um, which, again, that whole theme, as I mentioned in the previous video, of the Jewish leaders being these prideful, religious zealots, uh, you know, that were better than everybody else. That was all tailored off of the uh, suitors from the Odyssey. The suitors were the religious, prideful zealots of uh, Ithaca, and they were better than everybody else. And they're eating up Odysseus' estate. 
uh, just like the the prideful Pharisees were eating up the uh, substance of Jesus. Remember our last video when we uh, detailed, you know, shall I cast some bread to dogs? Basically, shall I waste my substance on dogs? Just as Odysseus said to the suitors and those outside of his circle that they are wasting a substance and called them dogs. But the important part here I want to make sure we really, really hit on, and this is a recurring theme throughout the Gospels, not just here in verse 14 and 15, but in, in other places within the Gospels. Jesus will commit a miracle. He'll heal somebody or, or whatever. And when he does this, he'll kind of slip out of their grasp. The religious leaders who are trying to, you know, uh, persecute him, he'll, he'll kind of slip out of their grasp. You know, he'll, he'll, he'll escape. And he also tells people time and time again not to tell anyone. Don't tell anybody who did this. Um, if you uh, <clears throat> go back here, um, Jesus, again, made sure to tell this man and in other stories not to tell anybody. And he escapes out of the uh, the uh, the prideful uh, Jewish leaders. He escapes out of their grasp. In the Odyssey, Odysseus is very cunning. Okay, uh, he's one of the cunning ones here as well. And he tells many people. Okay, uh, especially like the nurse Yerkalia in the Odyssey when she discovered who he was. Okay, and she knew his true identity and that it was really Odysseus. She, he told her and commanded her not to tell anybody. And Odysseus does this with a couple characters. He orders them not to tell anybody who he is. Why? Because it wasn't time for Odysseus to reveal to everyone who he really was. Just like Jesus commands many times over, a common theme in the Gospels, and we find it here in John as well, that he commands people not to tell anybody who he is. Because his hour had not come yet. All right? Another aspect of this, too, is goes back to the Bacchae. Jesus, every, every, there's, I think there's three instances within the, all four Gospels combined where Jesus escapes their grasp. He kind of slips away. He'll do something. The Jewish leaders are about to persecute him, uh, have him arrested, uh, or stone him to death, whatever the case may be. And every time Jesus slips through the grasp, he escapes out of there, right? This goes back to the Bacchae, okay? With Dionysus, remember we talked about Dionysus in earlier videos. Dionysus is the son of God. His, God. his father is God, Father God, and he had a mortal mother. And when Dionysus was uh, you know, doing his ministry, Pentheus, who was the king uh, uh, of that time, he, he hated Dionysus, right? And the, the men under uh, Pentheus, the soldiers under Pentheus hated Dionysus. And they tried to trap him many times. And every time they they every time they almost had him, Dionysus would slip out of their grasp. All right. Uh, there's also a story in the Bacchae before Dionysus. And we're going to get into this again. Oh, the heart of this nemesis is going to be later on in these chapters. But when Dionysus was uh, 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 going to be arrested, the the Pentheus and his soldiers had to be very careful in how they were going to arrest Dionysus. They couldn't just go out and openly arrest him because there would be an uproar. It could be a riot, okay? So they had to do it safely. They had to do it in, at night. They had to do it when there was nobody around. They had to kind of do it in secret. Same thing with Jesus. When the Jewish leaders wanted to persecute him and arrest Jesus, they had to do it at night. They had to do it in secret. It had to be... It had, to be, they had, it had to be safe because it would have been a riot going on. That's where those themes come from, okay? The theme of Odysseus not wanting anyone to tell anybody who he is because it wasn't his hour yet. The same as Jesus not wanting anyone to know who he is because it's not his hour yet. And uh, uh, Dionysus and the Bacchae escaping the grasp of his persecutors time and time again before he's ultimately arrested at nighttime with nobody around by a band of soldiers. Just like Jesus was able to slip out of their grasp many times, and the uh, and and Herod and well mainly uh, uh, Caphius wanted him arrested at night when it was peaceful and dark and nobody was around because they didn't want an uproar. That's where those themes come from. All right, sorry, go a little too far off here. Let's go on to verse sixteen. So, because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, 
but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Pause that just for a second, because this takes us back to the Makai, and this will become more clear later. <clears throat> At one of the sentencing events of Dionysus in the Makai, he was being a, a trial with, with Pentheus. Pentheus and, and, and Dionysus were having a trial. And Pentheus was asking him, you know, you talk about your father. I don't see him. I don't see your father. Dionysus says, my father is where I am. In other words, you see me, you've seen the father. Dionysus claimed that God is his father. All right. And this, of course, pissed uh, Pentheus off, just like it's pissing off uh, the uh, Jewish leaders here. So, And I'm going to go over that more in later chapters as it becomes a little more evident. But for right now, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it like that. Let's go on to verse 19. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. This is very important. And I wanted to, uh, to pull this up because of, of how important it is. Um, and I wrote in my book, uh, Homer versus New Testament, under the section uh, called Calm the Wind. I want to read this from Odyssey 10. It's a little paragraph from Odyssey 10. Uh, it says, King Oleus denied me nothing. He gave me a sack, the skin of a full-grown ox, binding inside the winds that howl from every quarter. For Zeus, the father, had made that king the master of all the winds, with power to calm them down or rouse them up as he pleased. The key point in this here is a story of King Oleus, Okay. King Oleus was obviously a king, but the story in Odyssey 10 about King Oleus is he could do nothing without the father. The father, he, he, could, he could rouse the winds up or calm them down, but only by the power of the father could he do this. He could do nothing without the father. Just as Jesus here, for the father loves his son, or I'm sorry, go back a little bit, for, a little further than that. Jesus has very true, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing. So again, Jesus is what? He's a king, right? King of the Jews. Jesus is a king that he can only do what the father, he sees his father doing. King Oleus in Odyssey 10 could only do what the father, he saw the father do. They are both kings, right? That's where this story comes from. Uh, if you don't believe it, then go a little further in the same paragraph I just read from King Oleus in Odyssey 10. He has the power to rouse the wind or the waves or calm them down. Okay, Recall when Jesus calmed the storm, right? Uh, it was a, He was on a boat and the, the waves were contrary and he calmed the storm. He calmed the wind. How did Jesus do this? Only by seeing what the Father does. Same thing with King Oleus. King Oleus calmed the winds, calmed the storm, only by seeing what the father does. That's where this whole tale of a king being able to calm the wind comes from. This is not unique to Christianity. This is These are all tales with the act of mimesis used from stories from Greek literature. Uh, every one of them. There's not a single story in the New Testament, especially Gospels and Acts, that is, uh, that, that is unique or original in itself. All right, so uh, go ahead and continue. On to verse 21. For just as a father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he pleased to give it. Moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son, that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. It's positive for a second. That kind of goes back to Dionysus. Dionysus, again, was the son of God, son of the father God, and a mortal mother in Semele. And Dionysus says in the Bacchae that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father is where I am. That's where this whole idea of, of a demigod, born of a father god and mortal mother, being here on earth and, and through the logo, God manifests in the flesh, and doing all these acts and miracles comes from that of Dionysus. Okay? He, Dionysus was primary son of the father god Zeus. All right, let's go on to verse 24. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as a father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. 
and he has given him authority to judge because he is a son of man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. This is talking, I'll pause that for a second there. This is talking about... Uh, the end time resurrection. You know, those that have done good will rise to life. Then the done evil will be contempted and and, uh, and and be judged. This whole idea of an end time bodily resurrection of all the righteous comes from the Sasashian cult. Uh, that, this is an amazing one. Zoroastrianism was the main Persian religion dating back around the 13th century BCE. But around 500 BCE, and what they call the Yashtis, these are holy texts of the Zoroastrians. There is a major talk in a couple of these uh, chapters within there of the savior figure, Sasashian. And Sasashian is believed the future Messiah that will be born of a virgin. Uh, when he comes, he'll, he'll, there'll be an end of days battle. Uh, he'll slay a great dragon uh, that will be loose for a little while. It'll be mourning and limitation on the earth. The earth will melt with fervent heat. Any of this sounding familiar? But also that all of the righteous dead will rise from their graves. Okay, This was all inspired by the Zoroastrian tradition, which Christianity has a baseline of Judaism. Okay, which was influenced from Zoroastrianism, but they're, they're all of their uh, stories were mainly Greek. But this makes sense. This is where they got that idea from. This is a part of the syncretism that, that occurs, and that comes from the Sasashian cult. I go over that in a few other videos. Um, watch my video series of Rom, uh, Romulus and Zalmoxis. I put a Sasashian in that one as well. So it, it's absolutely uh, amazing. Go to verse 31. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is true. Pause that for a second. This is kind of a contradiction. If you read here in uh, verse 31, Jesus says, If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. So in other words, he can't testify to himself. If he just testifies to himself, his testimony is not true. What's interesting, if you uh, read John 8, 14, same exact book, three, chapter, uh, three chapters later, it says, Jesus answered and said unto them, though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. So let me ask you a question. Is Jesus bear his own record, make it true or not? And read again verse 31. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. But in chapter 8, he does testify about himself and his testimony is true. So that's more of a contradiction than anything else, uh, no matter what kind of theological acrobatic moves you make. Uh, let's go to verse 33. You have sent to John, and he has uh, testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. I have testimony weightier than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing, testify that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you. For you do not believe that the one who sent. You study the scriptures diligently, because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Now pause that just for a second there. This Again, this whole thing about the Father and the Son is mainly Dionysus. Uh, because, again, Dionysus is the demigod, born a father god, mortal mother. And Dionysus talks about his father dramatically throughout the Bacchae, just like Jesus talks about the father throughout the Gospels. And in the Greek world, if you were to get in a time machine and go back to the first century, or any time before, and you ask everybody in the ancient world, if I say father god, who am I referring to? 100% would say Zeus. Zeus was considered Father God in the Greek world. In the Hellenized world, he was Father God. This whole Father thing comes from Greek. It all stems from Greek literature. All right, so going to verse 41. I do not accept glory 
from human beings. But I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe since you accept glory from one another, but do not seek the glory that comes from the one only God? But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom you are hopes are set. If you believe Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? Uh, that ends the chapter there. This whole thing Moses wrote about me is very interesting. The Jewish people know their scriptures better than anybody because they're, they're the ones that wrote it. It's written in Hebrew. Uh, and that's the problem a lot of Christians have is they don't read Hebrew. So they have to go through the Christology of reading it in, in their primary language, usually of English. But in regular Hebrew, if you're able to read it, it's quite different than, than English. Um, and I don't know Hebrew fluently. I know a few words here or there. But I have seen enough where it's, it's dramatically, dramatically different. But Moses wrote about me. It's very interesting. Uh, I don't know the exact verse, but uh, it was in Deuteronomy where Moses says, After me, a uh, prophet will rise up in the midst of thee, and him you shall hearken to. And a lot of Christians believe that this is Jesus. You know, this is the gospel Jesus that he's talking about. But when you when you read Deuteronomy, it's very clear uh, through the whole Torah that that character is jo uh, Joshua. When Mo the, jo Moses was passing the torch to Joshua, he is the one he's referring to when Moses says, uh, there will be a prophet that rises up in the midst of thee. It will come after me. Him you will hearken to. He's talking about Joshua, who would, Moses would basically pass the torch on to Joshua, which would help lead them into the promised land. And interestingly enough, the name Jesus in Greek is Joshua. So yeah, that's very interesting there. But that's because that was done intentionally. That wasn't an accident. Actually, in the first century, in the Greek world, there was no letter J, by the way. It actually would have been Isis. It would have been spelled I E S U S. There was the letter J was not invented until centuries later. So when you hear a name Jesus, it actually would have never been pronounced that way, uh, even in our language. Um, the letter J didn't exist, but that that was done intentionally to make that connection from Moses to Joshua, because when you're in the you know early centuries and you're reading the Greek Septuagint of the Tanakh, the, the Torah part especially, and you're reading about Moses and Joshua. And then you go over to the Gospels, you're reading the name Joshua. So you connect that dot much easier than you would today. But Moses wrote about me. I would like to see where he wrote about him. Because I just gave you one example, and that wasn't Jesus from the Gospels. That was Joshua, patriarch that took over after Moses. It was a passing of the torch, so to speak. But he, they, this reading Jesus into the Hebrew Scriptures, there's, there's ask yourself one question. You know, it, take away all presuppositions for a minute. The Hebrew people are the ones that wrote the Old Testament. They're the ones that know the Hebrew scriptures. They're the ones that wrote it in their own language, in their own country. I mean, and, and when you read, whenever you study it in Hebrew, it, a lot of people don't read Jesus, 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 Jesus into it. Into it. Instead, of, instead reading. of the Tanakh first and discovering that the Gospels, it doesn't allow for that. Because the Christians will do it the other way around. That's really the only difference between a Christian and a Jew. Jews start with the the uh, foundation of the Torah, the t and then in the whole Tanakh, and then anything after that, if it doesn't align with that premise, they reject it. Which that's why they reject Jesus. Christians do it the other way around. Christians will go off of their their premise, and that's Christianity is true. Jesus is the Christ, Son of God, and they'll read that back into the Hebrew Scriptures. Okay, but. The Hebrew script, the, the Hebrew scriptures are supposed to be Christianity is supposed to be the fulfillment of it. So if it doesn't align with that, they're doing it backwards. Is what I'm trying to say. Give you an example. Um, the Mormons did this back in the uh, 1800s. They made the Book of Mormon. Okay, and the Mormons do the same thing the Christians do. They just go one step further. <clears throat> the Mormons will take the Book of Mormon as the ultimate truth, and they read all of that into the New Testament and into the Old Testament. Just like Christians read everything in their premise in the New Testament into the Old Testament. Jews simply take the foundation, okay? And that's the, the whole Tanakh, uh, mainly the Torah. But a lot of your branched religions later on that blossomed out, like Christianity, later Islam came out of a branch out of Christianity and so forth, 
was was they were putting their emphasis on their new premise instead of going back to the beginning premise. And the Hebrew scriptures simply don't allow for it. But uh, there were some good Nemesis stories in here, especially uh, King Oleus was a good one there. But now once we get into the next chapter, it's really going to ramp up. Uh, the stories are going to get a little bit more maximized as we go forward. So please stick with me. There, are, especially in the Gospel of John, it is. Especially if you haven't read, uh, listened to my other videos. Some of these stories are going to blow you away where they uh, originated from. So we're really going to ramp up as we uh, as we move forward in this thing, going on to John chapter six and and going forward. All right, guys, going to do it for this chapter. Uh, go ahead and go to the next side, and we will continue over there.